not 1948? 1948. I was born in 43. Um, Malibu was just countryside. The Malibu Pier was there. The Malibu Inn was there. But once you uh, went up the Pepperdine Hill, it was just open country. And when I was five years old, I go on a Sunday drive with my folks up the coast for a little getaway drive. And one of the highlights was st stopping by Malibu Beach, which was all fenced off. It was private property. There was no lifeguards there. There was uh, no sidewalks there. It was just dirt shouldered on old barbed wire fence. And I remember coming back down the coast highway and stopping and pulling over in the old Packard and getting out of the car and holding on to the strands of barbed wire with my folks standing next to me, watching these these guys with that Waikiki Birdman style coming into the shore break on those big heavy boards. And I thought, man, that is so cool. Now my dad worked for Northrop Aircraft, New Jack Northrop personally, and worked on the original Flying Wing uh, post-World War II. My dad was real good with his hands, though he didn't surf himself. Um, went down the beach and, and talked to uh, some of the old timers there, like Buzzy Trent and Marge Calhoun, Doc Paskowitz was there in those days, and uh, talking to them about surfboard design. You were just a kid. I was just knee high and very shy. I didn't want to talk to those grown ups, so my dad took me down there and looked at some Simmons boards and some chips and made me a hollow little uh, paddle board four feet long, four and a half feet long with my name on it. I still have it in my living room. I still have it in my living room. It is a trip. I took it down and showed Belzy a long time ago. Belzy was very impressed. My dad never surfed and made this thing with a V-bottom. Pretty cool. But my dad actually made my first three surfboards, that first Your four. Dad made my dad made them in the garage. He made the first hollow one, four and a half feet. I couldn't stand on it, but I learned how to belly slide. Then he made me an eight-foot balsa board that looks just like a, a Simmons sandwich board. Big wide square tail, hull design, bellied up spoon nose, down rail tail, 10-inch wide tail with two half-moon fins on it. And that's what I learned to stand up on. A twin fin. Well, you, you got to remember, Simmons and all those guys were up there experimenting with those new shapes. My dad just went up there and took drawings of all the stuff, asked the guys if he could measure them. Sure, no problem. And went home and was really good with his hands. And got some wood and just made it in the garage. Made sketches. Glass them too, right? There was a place, well, that, that first wood one was just... Um, Boat varnish. Yeah. His boat varnish and seal up. A hollow one. It was a hollow yeah. one with a, a ribbing like an airplane wing and inlaid panels. One on the deck, two on the V's at the bottom. And then the ball, when the ball support was made, fiberglassing was coming in because uh, they you had to put it obviously on balsa wood. There was a place down at El Segundo that was doing fiberglassing on boat decks called Pacific Fiberglass. And so my dad shaped a balsa board and took it down there and we got these guys to. Fiberglass at that first balsa board, and the guy said, "Who shaped this board for this kid?" He goes, "Oh, I did." They said, "Well, you want to do some work for us?" And he goes, "No, I got a job at Northrop Aircraft. I'm just doing this for my son." So, but we grew up with that kind of mentality at Malibu because it wasn't a competitive lifestyle. There's no surf shops, no surf teams. It was just people going up to get away from the city and. Everybody was supportive. I remember trying to stand up. Guys weren't pushing you off. Guys were coming up behind you. And, it's okay, kid. We got. They would hold you up and encourage you to surf. Different kind of people. Right? Different world. Different world. So growing up in the 1950s, um, people ask me once in a while, "What are my favorite span of years at Malibu?" I say 55 to 65. Because by 55, I got pretty good. Because number one, there wasn't a crowd factor. People were supportive, and you could ride waves uninhibited and learn so much in one summer. Uh, what I was trying to say is, surfing is no different than that. You're just having fun on a piece of car. You know, you know, I've told this story a couple times since the trade show here today about I came out of high school and. You had to have bright trunks and be noticed and do all the arching and the hands out and the look at me, look at me. 
I remember 1959, I went to Rincon and really started getting into serious winter surfing. Uh, 59, I was only 15, but my buddy Rick Chrysler was an, a, a year older, so he had the driver's license. He was doing the driving. And I remember going out there doing what I thought was really hot stuff. Bob Cooper was working for Yater back in those days. And Bob Cooper was kind of well respected up in those in those days. And when he came walking toward you, you knew he had something to say. You never knew what he was gonna say, but he had to stop and listen. And I remember that day he walked over toward me, he walked toward me like this, and I go, uh oh, what am I in for now? I remember the day he walked up to me and he said, Lance, you got all the qualities to be a really good surfer someday. Just quit trying to be a movie star. I started putting my hands down, trying to surf like Phil Edwards and all these guys, like a ballet, not a jitterbug, a ballet. Greg Little told me something in the 1970s. When we would go down to Malibu, he was doing all those nice Greg Little plane boards, boards that worked. He'd make them for a purpose, not for show. And I had, was having Greg Little blast my boards back in the 70s. And we would sit down the beach and Greg Little would sit there and laugh at all these guys doing all the flash in the show and he said, what's going on here? I thought surfing was the idea of taking something very difficult and making it look as easy as possible. That is it. Yeah. It, and as we've gotten older, I think back, I think back in those days and yeah, we had fun. You know, I did a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, when I take that back, yes I would, but it's the development and the maturity that I, I think a lot of us have. I just had a great conversation with Tom Mori. And Tom's here? Tom Mori is here. Tom Mori is here. And we were talking about the 60s at Malibu and Rincon. I used to see him all the time. And today was the first time we really complimented each other and mention memories about watching each other surf. When you're younger, you got the ego, you don't tell somebody else how great they were. You know? And now we're older, we had a lifestyle that any 10 guys would give their right arm for, and it's appreciation. And age is very humbling, and man, I'm, my dad was a very spiritual guy, I get this from him, but I thank God every day for what I was blessed with. The way I tell tell people about my blessings is God paid me in advance. He gave you what? God paid me in advance. Uh, how much of the Big Wednesday is real? Well, the storyline is fictional, but the whole idea, because I knew John Milius per personally yeah. back when he was in high school. He's he one was, of the guys that hung out there, right? Yeah, he was a big guy, but a doggone good surfer, you know? And he always had this uh, love of surfing, and of course, when he got in the movie industry, uh, Jeremiah Johnson, Dillinger, all this, you know, Conan, all these people were like these uh, fictional, semi-fictional heroes that he would tell a story about the people that he revered as heroes. So, one of his first loves was surfing, and he had this idea about a storyline for three surfing comrades. Well, I never hung around with Mickey Dora and, and the masochists. I, I saw them at the beach, but I didn't really hang with them. So he took an individual from this part of the beach, one from that part of the beach, and made this fictitious, this fictional trio, okay, and based the story of the com serving camaraderie around that. So the actual movie and storyline is fiction. The idea came from a couple of characters in Malibu. I did an interview, a cassette tape interview with Denny Alber when the movie was being sculpted. And Denny came up to my house and a lot of the uh, uh, bar fight in Mexico, they want to see the bar fight in Mexico, uh, the food fight between Gary Busey and Jan Michael Vincent, the food fight, Kemp, Kemp Alberg and I had a, a food a spaghetti food fight at a place down in uh, South Laguna called Polly's Pizza back in the early 60s. So all those incidents came from real life story, real life stories, but when they made the movie, they kind of glued, they glued these things together. I had a problem with the continuity. 
because they just took pieces of this and glued it together and then John had his his buddy characters and I remember going to the premiere and watching that I, I had mixed emotions um, I was originally Matt Matt Johnson uh, Jack Barlow was Kent Ballberg and Leroy was uh, Mitch Lockman who was a personal friend of John and um, we had some legal problems during the making of the movie and I was cut loose, came back to California from El Salvador and got on with my life because I didn't really, I didn't want the movie thing or being the fall that, that, that's, that's not me, that's not me. And so um, I got cut loose, uh, it was a bittersweet thing, today it's a kind of a, a legendary surf icon, but what the heck, it's there, it's part of the deal. Tell me about Bear, who was he? Bear was... You could call him a of conglomerate yeah. of the Hobie, Belzy, Hap Jacobs, Brewer, uh, Harbor. He was just like the guy that you go to. You're, you have your mom and your dad, but when you're surfing with your buddies on a Saturday afternoon, where do you go afterward? You can hang around the shop. And these guys were like our big brothers or our second dads. And they represented the guys that we looked up to and respected. So the interchange between Matt Johnson and the Bear, when they're talking about that day that will come, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the respect that the surfing talent has for the guys that built the boards. It was like it was like the chalice being handed down, so to speak. I mean, you can figure that one out. It's you know, it's like camaraderie and respect. Was there ever a day where you really shined? You were probably alone. You didn't have your buddies with you. I mean, was there a day that? Oh, there's a few. Just yeah. Split. A big day. Like uh, two summers ago, uh, Hamilton was there. Remember that? He shot the pier. Mm -hmm. You know, that was some kind of summer. That was well. You know, a lot of the days that I remember that really personally stand out for me were not the days, the big days, because it really got competitive. And you know that back in the 60s, Jacob's team would show up from Hermosa. I was part of the team, but I lived up in that area. Uh, the Dewey Weber guys would show up. The Bing guys would show up. It got really competitive. There was no contest, but it felt like that. There was a tense vibe. Some of the best days I got were those summer weekdays when guys like Jim Ganser and Robbie Dick and all the local guys were hanging around up there. And it'd be a three to four foot day, minus tide. I remember one day Jim Ganser, Jim Ganser was the kind of guy that always got emotional. And I got a wave, a set wave way out in the point. And I took off, I used to like to get way on the other side of the peak and go left, wait till the last minute, bring it around and walk up, get on the tip. I rode this wave on the tip all the way from the outer first point all the way down past the end of the wall on the tip, back pedal and kicked out. Ganser was up there screaming on the beach, I don't believe it, I don't believe it. That I think it was more Jim Ganser than I remember than, than the ride I got. But, but that was what's cool about a lot of those old personalities on the beach because we were all pals and everybody loved what you did. One last question, we'll make this a the most important thing in life to you? I know that's a big Think about it a while. Yeah. Out of everything you've done it's, and it's, have had, it's, had it's 73 for me. Because you know, when you when you're a standout in this business or any business, entertainment or for us surfing, I believe I learned this from my dad. The most important thing that a human being has is your conscience. Your conscience is your moral, your moral measuring stick. At the age I am now, the blessings I've had with what I've been able to do goes hand in hand with the flip side of that coin, which is the people you hurt along the way and the regret. And I have a conscience, thanks to my dad, that I look back I shake my head at some of the things I've done in shame and self-disappointment. But I think that happens to all of us in a sense. It's part of the learning process. And if there are anybody if there's anybody out there that I did hurt along the way, here I am at this point in my life, I'm sorry. But um, regret goes along with 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 joy and happiness, you know, and if I had to do these things over, I probably 
knowing what I know now, of course I would. But I've had people tell me, hey, that's what helped you develop. It's part of what you did. It's history. It's a memory. Deal with it and move on.